This is the 27th episode of uh, the Oz Longboarding Podcast. So, um, yeah, wherever you're watching from around Australia, around the world, um, tonight's a special special edition. We have um, a pretty special guest residing in uh, Yamba from the northern New South Wales um, coastline. And we have Taylor Jensen on tonight. G'day, Taylor. How are you, Jack? Good to hear from you. You too, mate. Yeah, pretty good. We also um, have the usuals on. We've got Sean McEwen. Um, Hi, Addy Chono Chinaski, who just turned um, the ripe age of, what did I say, man? <laughs> 30, uh, uh, 32. Something, 32. Yeah. And um, also Kira Mona. So um, just quickly, guys, how is, how's the waves down in uh, your way, Matty? Uh, super summary. Um, yeah, that, I don't think anyone really bothers after, you know, everyone's stoked after such a good winter. Everyone's kind of getting their stuff done and... Um, uh, for not much surfing, the surfboard industry is really, really busy. Surf shops are bustling. I know FCS are, you know, struggling to keep up with manufacturing stock. And, you know, that's a really good sign for our industry. And, um, and I think just Australian uh, manufacturing in general, um, everyone I know who's a tradesman and a hell of a lot of surfers are, seem to be really busy. Um, and there's been a big demand for Australian-made products at the moment. And um, I think it is only going to help our surf industry. So... Yeah, Sydney's pumping and uh, waves not so much, but the vibe's pretty high. Yeah, good to get some work in while it's, um, you know, get into those nor'easters and... Yeah, exactly. Not those good south swells like we've had, but um, Kira, what about you? How's it up there in uh, the sunny coast? Um, yeah, it's been pretty good. We've had a few storms randomly lately, um, a little bit of rain and not that many waves, but no complaining because we did have a good winter. Um, so I guess summer has kicked in and again, those north leaves and kind of softer swells, which I'm glad I surf longboard for. <laughs> yeah, that's right. That's cool. Paging, uh, getting all the conditions under all on the one roof. Shawnee, how's it um, up your, your way in the Tweed Coast? Mate, it's um, been a little bit small this week, and that, but uh, today or this morning at Rainbow Bay, they tell me it was all time. Only small, but just the banks are still perfect. Water's warm. Gentle offshores this morning. Yeah, uh, it was pretty good. Yeah, nice. I feel like it's coming into that time of the year where we get those nor'easters and those smaller, long flat spells. But um, how's it only means it's a matter of time before the big cyclones. Yeah, <laughs> yep, that's right. Taylor, how's uh, how you, how you been going, mate? You've been getting some waves um, at home, and you've been on the hunt or. Yeah, tell us what you've been up to the last couple of um, during, during lockdown. Yeah, we've had a few little waves. I mean, nothing amazing, obviously. Um, yeah, but there's been plenty of swell to ride, and yeah, I've been chasing it a bit up your way and meeting up with you, and yeah, got some fun waves at Water Goes, and yeah, just kind of cruising around and trying to hunt down a few waves where we can, and yeah, get away from the winds and yeah. enjoy the warm water before. I don't know if I end up back in California or something, it's going to be awfully cold. So yeah, yeah just, just enjoying this time of year in Australia, which I've, I've been here once over 14 years. I've only been in Australia this time of year once. So it's nice to see a different season and yeah, just kind of experience it in a different way. Kind yeah, of a that's... blessing in disguise. Making the most of it. Yeah, for sure. I mean, it's nice to be in, in warm water and board shorts instead of a four, three and booties. So it's pretty yeah, good. I bet. I bet. Yeah. Nice mate. And, um, yeah. Yeah, we've got some pretty exciting uh, questions and thanks for coming on tonight. It's, um, I'm sure there's a lot of people that are watching or will be watching at some point that are keen to pick your brain and ask a few questions to you. And um, yeah, I think everyone's excited to get to understand a little bit more about you and your career and um, how long you've been, you know, obviously competing on the world tour, how many events and world titles you've won and um, yeah, get a bit more insight into what you do and your equipment and all that sort of thing. I'm sure there's going to be a few good questions getting thrown around about the tour and, um, you know, a few opinionated questions, I'm sure. But yeah. let's get the ball That's rolling. That's good. Okay. Hey, I'd Sounds like good. to open with um, something that just follows on from what you said, Taylor, about, yeah, I've been here 14 years and that, but first time this time of year. Um, we've got the Olympic Games coming up next year and that, and... Um, I just want to know who you'll be cheering for. Will it be the US or Australia? 
Oh, get straight into it. All right. Um, <laughs> geez. Oh, look, I've, I've always got to cheer for America first. It's born and bred. You know how that is. Um, yeah, I, I know a lot of those guys who will be competing and I've known them for years. And yeah, obviously I want to see those guys do well. But, you know, I think there's going to be some dark horses that come out in those games, guys who have really been putting in the work behind the scenes. And, yeah, I think there'll be a few surprise nations that come to the table with some pretty good, good teams. And on the uh, patriotic front, uh, Trump or Biden? No, I'm joking. You don't have to answer that. Uh, no. <laughs> I, I, I don't vote, so um, I, yeah. I really don't have a say. I kind of relinquish my opinions by not voting. Well said. <laughs> Can I just pipe in in the background? I am here, even though my camera's not working, folks. And, uh, I'm so sorry. Yeah, mate. It's okay. Look, look at you. You, don't, you don't rock up for weeks on end and you take over and just ignore me. <laughs> You're so, um, so, so mate. How are you, mate? How, how's the surf been over your way, firstly? Mate, uh, where, where I live, the swells have been really um, unsettled. So we haven't really, we've had some great conditions, but there hasn't really been any good waves. And I've been really busy with other things. So I haven't really done much surfing, but uh, hoping to get wet on the weekend. But I'm uh, really excited to see Taylor here. And I just thought I'd explain to the viewers that uh, I've just dumped you in the, the hot seat seconds before going to air. So thanks for doing that for us, mate. Good to see you back on board. But um, Taylor, on board, I believe you've got a couple of new models out in some, in, in some new construction. Sorry, the, the TJ Pro and uh, you've got three signature models now. Uh, what are you excited to be riding? What are you riding at the moment? Um, honestly, I've been jumping on pretty much all of them on a pretty regular basis, um, just depending on what the surf's doing. But they're all now just hyped on the Thunderbolt tech. And um, yeah, just being able to get my models that I had pre-existing with Firewire and the Timber tech, trying to transfer it over into Thunderbolt Red and Thunderbolt Black. And you know, just getting used to that, that change in tech and you know, obviously the added performance that it has. You know, I pretty much blew my mind from day one. And every time I ride it, it's just kind of, I'm learning more about the way that the boards flex and in different ways to control them and yeah look it's every session's more progression it's it's pretty crazy to to kind of be where i'm at in my career and still be feeling like i'm getting better every surf and yeah i'm, I'm just stoked to be riding the boards that i'm on now and, and in that tech it's pretty insane so the and, footage, um, saw the oh, footage sorry. from the kelly's wave pool so and just in, incredible to see the the surfing that you're able to do uh, we've spoken a lot about pools over recent weeks that you, you for it Hundred percent, yeah. I think they're insane. I think as far as uh, like a training ground, they're pretty next level. The the sport's going to take off, performance wise, with that. And it, it's also it's just a really rad experience. Like it takes the, the aggression and the hassling and all of that out of the water. And it's like your wave when it comes. It's your wave. There's no hassling. There's no competitive nature to it. It's like it's your turn to shine. Everybody's smiling, watching you get a wave. Like it's just a really different experience. That. For me, I've had more fun like watching guys get the barrel of their life at Kelly's Pool than me getting my barrel. It was cooler to see these guys who had, had never gotten barreled getting drained. Like it's just such a different sort of experience as a surfer to really put on that big of a smile watching somebody else. And you know, I think that if that's kind of where the future goes, that's a pretty rad thing. And just to start it, start it off at the beginning, Taylor, because this will end up on uh, we do the Facebook uh, live recording and it'll go onto YouTube um, three-time world champion um, considered to have along with Harley Ingleby you know rewritten the, the book of um, you know performance longboarding through the last decade or two um, you've got huge accolades with Australasian titles and American titles and so many event wins um, tell us a little bit about how you got into longboarding and um, yeah, your path that led you into competitive um, surfing in the first place? Um, basically, I grew up in a town that had really bad waves. Um, I grew up in a town in South San Diego that was really sheltered from kind of almost every different direction of swell until we got a hurricane, and then it would get huge and look like Puerto Escondido. So for me, it was like I shortboarded when it was really good, but throughout the rest of the year, I had to pick up a longboard just to, to keep the stoke alive and to stay in the water. So I kind of got into it through that. And then once a year, we would have a longboard contest, um, a memorial for an older guy who I never met who passed away. But it was like a way that the whole community got together, rode longboards, you know, classic beach culture, surf culture, hang out, surf all the kids, every different age division and stuff. So I got in through that and um, 
yeah, that just kind of kickstarted my, my love for the competitive side of things. And yeah, that sort of opened a door into kind of, well, maybe I can you know, make this work down the line. And we had a few guys in the town where I grew up who were, were kind of professionals and competing and stuff. And I saw where they were taking it and they're getting to travel and like, I'm seeing shots of them in Fiji and all over the world. And I'm going, dude, this is sick. Like, what if I can do that? Like, that's a cool career path. I'm going to try and make that work. And yeah, the little bits of success on an amateur level just kind of kickstarted that into sort of, I guess, the professional ranks and get a little bit of success early on in small pro events. And it just you know, it makes you want to do it more. What was your like earliest memory of your like best achievement? What event was that? Oh, gosh. Um, <laughs> Well, the, my first pro event that I entered was like a San Miguel Pro, which was, I think it was a part of like, not the Bud Pro Tour, but like, you know how there was a ton of different pro tours in America in the early 2000s. Um, they had this event down in Mexico and you know, a lot of the guys showed up, like um, Cyrus King and those guys were in it from back then. And yeah, I got really lucky. I made the final and I was like, just blown away that I'd even made a final against these guys. I was like, tripping out. They all had beards. I'm like this little scrawny dude. You know, I hadn't grown into my body yet. I was like a kind of like a puppy. And I was just like, man, wow, like I made a final. This is so cool. And and somehow I freakishly ended up winning it. And like that's my earliest memory of like, well, I won this little pro event, which to me at the time was the biggest achievement I could ever have dreamed of. And that was kind of like, okay, maybe I could sort of do this. Like, you know, I don't know if it's realistic and I had no idea. I was just a kid. I didn't know what it would look like, but that was my earliest sort of grasp at like that sort of professional level achievement and where it might be able to take me. Yeah. And so what, you, uh, oh, sorry, you want to be a professional surfer, what career path would you've gone down? Oh, honestly, I kind of gave up on a lot of things when I was in high school and, and I caught surfing. A lot of things just kind of went out the window for me. And, you know, I played a lot of basketball and volleyball and stuff in school. And maybe I would have gone that, that athletic, path and gone to college and done all that or you know I grew up my my dad managed a restaurant and then ended up owning a restaurant maybe I would have ended up there I, I, honestly I don't know as soon as I caught the surfing bug that was it like I was a one track I didn't have any backup plan or so it was really being an athlete that was it yeah for sure it was I mean surfing was it like I wasn't I don't know like I had teachers that told me you'll never make it you need a backup plan surfing's not a real career like I had all that stuff growing up. So for me, it was kind of a prove I'm wrong to the point where I had no option but to succeed because I, did, I didn't have a backup plan. Like I just didn't, I didn't go there. So I would have had to basically restart, go back to school and, and figure something out from there. But um, yeah, I'm glad it worked. <laughs> <laughs> and when, when, you, when you first kind of, you know, started doing those pro contests and kind of thought this is it, like I can, you know, maybe this is, this is me. Who were the kind of guys on the scene that you kind of looked up to and be like, was like, you know, yeah, that's those guys are ripping and that's who, you know, that's how I want to surf. And who were those kind of guys that you were, you know, inspired by? Oh man, um, look, Colin was a huge influence for me. Just growing up in California, regular foot, like it kind of goes without saying. Colin was the guy yeah. during that era. Um, Bonga, Bo, Darren Lettingham. Jai Burns. I mean, you can go down the list of all those guys who were ripping yeah. in, in 2002 when I was basically coming onto the world tour. Um, yeah, you know, Joel had a pretty big influence on me. I traveled with him um, and Darren and oh, especially Josh Baxter. And yeah. Josh took me under his wing when I was like seven, 16 or 17 mm. and was like, yeah, come travel with me and Darren and Joel and, you know, we'll, we'll basically show you the ropes and yeah, like that, those, those guys were definitely my biggest influence just on like how to travel, how to compete, like what to do, what not to do. Like, don't go out all late at night and party and stuff. Like, you know, you're making heats, focus, yeah. keep your, keep your act together. You can party at the end type of a thing. Like, you know, just like, I don't yeah. know. They just, they just, they really kept me, they kept, kind of kept me, got me into trouble, but kept me out of trouble at the same time. So it was like, they kind of showed me the, the fine line of have a really good time, but also you know, you're here for a reason and you're, you came here to win. So don't, don't back down and yeah. don't sabotage yourself. Yeah. Epic. And um, your style, you brought up Josh Baxter, um, Taylor, but out of all those guys you mentioned, I'll take a stab here and say, 
because uh, you did say you're growing into your body. Um, and I know some of that early footage of you and some of the clips, um, you kind of surf unlike anyone else that I can think of. Um, you've got a very unique style in yourself. Uh, with longboarders, especially, you see a lot of style cues. Um, and I guess because it's difficult and there's only limited ways to, to turn a longboard, um, but you kind of broke away from that. You use your body to your advantage. Who was your main influence? Would it have been Josh Baxter? Because that's the, out of all those listed, that's one that would sort of, the way he attacked the lip would be one that I would think would inspire you. Yeah, for sure. Josh Baxter and then also Jeff Kramer in a weird way. Mm. Um, I just like Kramer was super progressive. Same thing, Joey Hawkins too. Like got yep. to mention Joey. Um, they were just pushing progression super hard. And at that time in my life, like, that's all I wanted to do was just push progression, progression, progression. Like it's just all I was into. So, I mean, maybe it has something to do with coming from kind of a shortboard beginning. And, you know, I grew up in the momentum era of watching all those movies and did it. That was all about progression and like punk rock music. You know what I mean? Like that was just really like invested in that. So I just kind of wanted to surf that way and, and do it on a longboard. And yeah, I guess that's, yeah. yeah. Kids these days might think it's really weird because that area was a really progressive area for surfing. Um, Super progressive. You know, Super. From, from Huntington Beach down to the border, it was the one of one of the most cutting. It kind of took from a, from Narrabeen in Australia, you know, in many ways, and the Gold Coast. It was that was sort of the melting pot, and um, yeah, it's it's no surprise to me to see you come out of that. But those early movies. Um, even Mike Stidham's in a couple, some of the Japanese yep. sort of not bootleg movies, but the ones that used to come with like on the board. And um, I think it was on the board magazine. Some of that footage is, is so cool. You guys at Oceanside and um, just belting living daylights, but still a little bit of nose riding here and there in between. And um, yeah, it was, that's, that's cool. You mentioned those guys, Joey Hawkins as well. And, and Jeff Kramer, because uh, those guys were, uh, you know, that generation before you. Um, yeah. And then you sort of, you guys took it to the next level. Yeah, it was a cool, I don't know, growing up in those guys' shadow, like that's who I looked up to. But then they were gone by the time I kind of came on the tour. Like Joey was gone, Jeff was gone. Um, obviously Josh and Joel and, and Bonga and Colin were all still there. But yeah, it was just kind of watching something growing up and then translating it in your own way. I mean, I'm, I'm sure it's so much different for you. Like the guys who you idolized growing up were probably like Bob McTavish and Nat and in the 60s generation. But even Jason Blewett and Ray Gleave. Yeah, um, totally. Dane Wilson, Dane Wilson, those guys on a East Coast level. Um, you know, you, obviously we had Dave Simons and Jai Burns, um, you know, and, and then a little bit younger was, you know, Joel Tilly and um, Scott yep. Channon and Heath Norrish and guys Norris. like that. But um, what was that? Sorry, Jack? Yeah, no, I said Heath Norrish, yeah. Yeah, yeah. Heath Norrish. You know, yeah, he's yeah. big out to Heath. But um, no, exactly. You're a product of your environment. But um, And you're on the Hobies at the beginning. Were you on boards before that? Or the Hobies, your main sort of sponsor at the very beginning? Uh, no, before that, I was on Rusty. Like uh -huh. in, in Kevin Conley's Rusty days. So my first true nine-foot longboard was actually a hand-me-down from Kevin Conley. And it was a, it's in Blazing Longboards, actually. He's riding it. It's a full thruster. It's got like five black graphite, like, it looked like a, a modern carbon board, like five black strips next to the stringer, but it wasn't. It was just painted on. Yeah. So yeah, that's what I was on to begin with. I got a hand-me-down from Kevin, and then I started riding for Rusty. And um, yeah, I was with Rusty for, geez, from 13 to, I think, about 18. Who and then I, after that, I made the switch to Hobie. And then who did you go on to after that? Was it Bear or Laguna? No, it was Hobie. Hobie. I was Hobie. That was my first trip to Australia, so I guess it was... Yeah, I was, I was 16 at the time when I was with Hobie and I came out to Australia for the first time. And that was with like Trent Dickey, Jess Jerems. Yep. All those guys were on the Hobie team. So, um, so that was the Australian connection as well with the Hobie that, that, that sort of linked you up. Yeah, exactly. So that was kind of my introduction to, you know, the Aussie thing. Like we stayed at Jesse and Trent's house in Noosa for the event. And yeah, that was sort of the beginning of that, that whole thing. And then from Hobie, it went to Bear. And then I was with Bear for, I think, two or three years. And then from Bear, it went to Laguna Bay. Um, that just happened. I broke all my boards at the Nusa Festival when it was pumping. Didn't have a board. I was staying at Jesse's house. And it was like, um, well, I was staying. Actually, I think I was staying with Harley. 
And I was like, where do I get a board here? Like, I don't have any boards. And it was like, oh, well, Laguna Bay's out there. Go check them out. So I went out and just picked one off the rack and ended up winning the festival on it. And that was that. I just parted ways with Bear and, and went with Laguna Bay. So was the Bear connection anything to do with Bo Young? Were you dating Narva at the time? Nope. Nope. had no, no idea. The Bear thing, um, they just approached me out of nowhere. At the time, I was riding for Hobie and I was winning the world tour. I was tied with Joel going into the final event. It was my first year on tour. And we, we were going into New Zealand at Raglan. And I was tied. Yeah, I was tied with Bo, uh, tied with Joel. And it was just like, they approached me and just said, hey, you know, we want to pick you up. And I said, yeah, no worries. Cool. Let, let's do it. I, I wasn't searching for sponsorship or anything at that time. I was just kind of, I don't know, just so stoked to be on tour. And I had a family friend who was actually flipping the bill for me to be on tour. Um, just so that I could get out there. I didn't have sponsorship, really. That was, you know, no sponsors when you're 16, 17 or flow. Like, you, you're getting some free product and you're stoked to put a sticker on your board. It's not like they're paying for your flights and your hotels and everything else along the way. Yeah. Well, let, let's hope that changes in the future, hey, for everyone. Yeah, <laughs> no, I think, look, I think kids nowadays are getting a little bit smarter. You know, I don't think it's, I'm putting a sticker on my board because you gave me a bar of wax anymore. I think that there's... There's more to it. There's a lot more power in, in Instagram and social media and, and viewership and exposure. So I, th I think the kids are getting smarter and yeah, hopefully that brings about a, a better time for us. Mm -hmm. yeah. I'd like to your question, Taylor, from Peter Mullard. He says, where is the best longboard wave you have surfed with all your traveling? The best longboard <laughs> wave I have surfed? Um, might be a I'm secret. <laughs> say, no, 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 it's definitely not a secret. It's actually probably the most crowded wave on the planet. It's Malibu. Yeah. Um, when Malibu's pumping, it's, and you can actually get a wave yourself. Um, yeah, that's, to me, that's the, the best longboard wave on the planet. You just, it's kind of impossible unless it's a contest that you're going to get a wave to yourself. But um, yeah, when it does happen, it's pretty magic. And it's, it's pretty much like when it's head high and above, it's, it's a perfect wave no matter what you want to ride. It's one of those things that really caters to any type of board. Like you can ride a, a full traditional 60s board and, and have a blast. Or you can hop on a performance longboard and have a blast. It's like one of the few waves in the world I've found that suit anything at that size. There's normally kind of a, a breaking point where you kind of want to be on one or the other, but that wave just, it really suits anything. I thought you were going to say low is for sure. <laughs> no. Nah. I, I, I like lowers, but... Um, Honestly, like a, a six foot wave at Malibu or a six foot wave at Lowers, yeah. I'll take Malibu. Long I, thought, I thought you were going to say isolators at uh, Connison. <laughs> oh, yeah. <laughs> Jesus. Hey, don't laugh. Hey, does, actually, does it get above two foot? <laughs> Taylor, it always pumps me that. Oh. Hey, um, interesting. A lot of people may not be aware. Obviously, everyone knows after uh, six US Open titles. I mean, obviously, you're, you're a fantastic surfer and obviously a fantastic competitor. But what a lot of people might not be aware of is you uh, rip on a shortboard. Uh, I remember filming after surfing with you out at uh, Crescent one day and you swapped out your longboard and jumped on a shortboard and started busting airs. Um, a lot of people probably aren't aware of that. What, when you go surfing, what's the breakdown? Do you, do you find yourself 50-50 or mostly longboard, mostly shortboard when you just go on surfing for fun? Um, honestly, I just ride whatever the waves look like they, they just desire. I have a ton of boards in my car at all times and you know, whatever it looks like it's going to be the most fun. That's what I hop on. Unless I've got a contest coming up or, you know, I'm focused on designing a board or fins or something like that'll kind of weigh heavily on my decision. But um, yeah, most of the time, if the waves look good for a shortboard, I'm, I'm on a shortboard or looks good for a log, I'm on a log. I, you know, I don't discriminate on what I ride or, or have a preference, really. I just want to have the most fun possible, whatever the surf looks like. So jump on whatever's going to give you the most fun and, yeah, enjoy it. And if it doesn't work, come in and switch and ride something else. Sick. I'm going to, um, I wanted to throw it out to Maddie and Sean and everyone on, on the panel about obviously the tour and what you think, um, you know, what it's, what it's, how you've seen it change over the last few years. And um, yeah, it's going to get your, your, I'm sure there's a lot of viewers that you came to hear how you think, um, you know, if it's, if it's benefited yourself or how you've seen it change and how you've adapted to the new criteria and um, the new locations. Let us, yeah. What, what do you think, mate? Um, well, technically there's no new criteria, but I <laughs> mean, true. they just, they just need to say that and change the criteria. In my opinion, I think it's ridiculous to say that the criteria is the same. Nothing's changed. Like just rewrite it. It's pretty obvious 
with the judging and the scoring and stuff, like, it, you know, you just kind of, it's a false statement saying it's the same criteria because it's not. Um, I don't have anything against it by all means. I mean, we saw, um, was it last year? Yeah, last year, Taiwan, the surf got big. They rewarded more powerful surfing. Um, you know, I, I just, for me personally, the future that I see for longboarding is, is one that's super inclusive of all aspects. And, you know, I think that stops like that where we do get bigger swell. And, you know, like it was back in the 90s and, and early 2000s where guys had to be able to ride a knee high point break but they also had to be able to ride a six foot lowers type of a setup and yeah so you, think you know i think that, that that's that's the future like you could, otherwise you're just playing to such a small percentage of the market like you're not getting the most viewership possible you're not going to create as much interest like you're playing to a small kind of piece of the pie it, why not it, play to the whole actually, pie it actually hurts me taylor to see you surfing at 70 percent um <laughs> you know what I mean? It's like it's kind no, of no, no, for sure. It, it's like it, 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 it hurts me to dial it back, but you know, at the end of the day, like I'm there to win a fourth world title. I'm yeah. not. I don't, I don't show up just to surf. Like I'm, I'm there to win a fourth world title. I believe that a lot of the reason why I won three was because I can interpret a criteria and surf to it, and give the judges what they want to see. And that you, know, you can I, do better than I think anybody. Um, Joel too, probably yeah. both of you two can do that more than, than most, um, regardless of what the criteria would be. How many people yeah, have I mean, four, uh, how many people have four world titles? One. Who? Nah, 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 nah. Of course. Nah, it's the only one who's nah. got four. Rusty and Colin have three, and then Joel, Phil, Harley, Piccolo, Piccolo. and Bo have two. So you, you want two more, don't you? No, I want one more. <laughs> I'll, I'll, I'll happily. Yeah, I don't know. I mean, you know, you win three, what do you do? You walk away or you go for number four? Well, how do you look, look, I'll say this. I'm super content with three. I'm very happy with three if I don't win a fourth. I've had an amazing career and, I, and I'm very happy, but by no means am I done. By no means am I walking away. Um, yeah, I have a lot left in the tank that I'm ready to give just if we ever get contest back and that we can travel and there's a tour and there is such a thing as, as a world tour again, like I'm back. But um, well, yeah, I'm just... Can, can yeah, we sign you up for the Oz Longboarding Challenge at the Wave Pool at Tullamarine? <laughs> wave Pool? What? what? I, any opportunity to go to a Wave Pool, I'm in. Yeah, so... Mason, 100%. Mason Neverland, who's our, uh, our panel member from Victoria, couldn't be with us tonight. He had to go into the city. Uh, which is death-defying in Melbourne, they tell me. Uh -huh. But um, he he, uh, he works at the wave pool there, and uh, yeah, we've been hitting him up for the uh, the Oslo challenge. That's that's one of the few wave pools I haven't surfed. I'd, I'd be very interested. Me and Jack were actually talking about it. taking a little trip out there before this whole thing went sideways. But mm -hmm. um, yeah, I'd be pretty keen to get to get out there and, and surf that. I wouldn't mind getting up to that other one, wherever that is, in some mystery desert location. <laughs> that thing looks sick. That thing looks to me like you start talking about viability and and creating dollars and you know being able to run a sustainable business out of a wave pool. Yeah, that thing looks pretty promising to me. Just having five different waves on tap every plunge or whatever it is like that's that's pretty game changing as far as consumer ship goes. Yeah, and you've seen. Um Speaking of, uh, I guess, surf business, you've seen, uh, I guess, the background of a lot of stuff. You've had um, some relatively close contact with the surf relic. Um, I don't even know your uh, involvement or your, um, you know, it's on your home turf, I guess, Californian World Tour, some were calling it. Um, what was the relic like for you when it came out? Obviously, it would have just been riveting that you didn't have to travel anywhere for it. But um, what was it for you and what did it bring for you and what did you have involved with it? Well, I mean, it, you got someone coming to the table bringing Malibu and lowers as as your locations. Like, that's a dream come true. I think for any longboarder, like, having pristine locations when you've been going to places that don't really provide great platform for every surfer to, to compete, um, to me, that was game-changing. And, yeah, I, I mean, I was just a consultant for them. They asked me, you know, what kind of format works best for a longboard contest at Malibu? And it was like, well... You know, this is a cool format that we've used with the WSL over the years and 
I think that that's a, you know, it seems to work. Why, you know, you don't need to change it. Just, just stick with it. And they just bounce ideas off me and I give them my, my opinion and whether they took it or not was sort of their in-house dealings. But um, yeah, it was a cool, cool opportunity. I think for longboarding to get, to get some momentum behind it when it was really dying and, and struggling to get off the ground. I think that you know, what that team at Relic did was really positive for, for where we're at now. I think it's a big reason why WSL kind of kicked themselves into gear with longboarding and, and they saw the potential, they saw the way that Relic was marketing it. Mm. And I think that's when WSL really started to understand that, hey, there is this market for longboarding and, you know, we can really you know, kind of put a backing to it. Like obviously WSL is a massive organization with tons of resources to use. So I think when, when they kind of get their, their gears turning and, and see potential in, in making dollars and yeah, being able to market it out to their companies or their relationships that, you know, that longboarding just benefits. So I'm, I'm super grateful that Relic was ever there to kind of do what they did and, and give it a kickstart when it needed it. And yeah, it was a cool, cool experience to be able to give my feedback, you know, like in my years with WSL, they didn't really ever ask, what do you want or what do you like or what works or what doesn't? Um, it was just kind of here's your contest and and good luck. But um, yeah, it was cool to cool to just be able to have your input for for a change. You know, I mean, yeah. I know Harley is the representative for 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 our longboarders with WSL. I know it was a hard task for him, and you know, a lot of com one way conversations. And you know, it's just cool to see someone kind of take people's input and and put it to a platform. Yeah, there's no doubt that exact all the everything you said, um, you know, and combined, I guess, with uh, that emerging well, what was once underground interest of the Vans duct tape, which started to gain gain a little bit of you know uh, mainstream momentum as well, catapulted um, longboarding into the limelight uh, beyond WSL's uh, capabilities, and um, I think it's quite clear to everyone that now it's you just have to go on Instagram and have a look at it. My work page on Instagram is flooded with longboarding. Um, it's crazy. I should be seeing cars, but I'm seeing, you know, girls in Waikiki in barrel with people at pipe and, you know, guys in Noosa. It's and Benny Considine always pops up little goofy footer. Um, the guy puts out that many clips. It's crazy. Every time I turn on Instagram, it's like so ben Considine on a little left somewhere in Vico. And I'm like, so Vico's got reps? like, <laughs> but anyway, I'm diverting. But, um, and you, you kind of were talking as if relic might've been in past tense. Um, can you, I don't mean to ask any catch questions, there's no catch, but can you uh, allude to that? Is, is there something happening perhaps uh, with Relic in the future or a combination of things? I have, honestly, I have no idea with the whole COVID thing coming out. Like I, I have no idea. I know that they were planning to go ahead with the, another repeat sort of type of thing as last year and possibly add more events and keep growing. But um, yeah, I don't know what's happened with, with COVID and stuff. I'm not yeah. And on any, you know, I, I don't know. I'm just not privileged to that information. I wish I knew so I could yeah, plan yeah. my schedule accordingly. I wish I knew what the WSL had in store for us. Um, but hey, at least yeah. we all got a message the other day. From WSL. We did. We got a very cryptic message about a possible tour for 2021. And that was like kind of yeah. it. So, you know, we'll see, oh, but, um, Pioli's like uh, standing yeah. his pole. Yeah. Dana is just straight. Yeah, he's in. making his like, comeback, huh? He's been, yeah. he's been training. Hey? He's, been, he's been in the gym seven days a week. Wait. I thought you were going to say Sorry. rapping. <laughs> drinking now. He's, uh, yeah, be the same time the end of summer and I was thinking the end of this summer and I'm like, that's really soon. And then I realized <laughs> it's probably American summer. Yeah. Hey, Taylor, can I ask you a viewer question? Yep. So Michael Cottier, you've surfed with him many times over the years, being on opposite ends of the seating system. Um, Michael's actually got a few questions, but one he asked is, where in Australia and at which event did you find the most, or the best, most comfortable and convenient to the surf accommodation? Accommodation? Yeah. Um, hmm. That's an interesting one. Um, I mean, Kingscliff, we always had a pretty good spot. We just would end up booking something right there. But um, well, our noose is always so handy. Like I can't, maybe not for contest surfing, but when you get to stay at Little Cove and you can run out to nationals and surf while the other stuff's going on at the event or come back, it's a bit expensive, but it's a pretty sick spot to be posted up. Like I can take the kids down to Little Cove and surf in between heats and 
like that's i mean as far as a contest venue that place is like an amphitheater if the waves are on at first point and yeah it's about as good as it gets really like it's nice and it's comfy and yeah you kind of tuck back in the rainforest and get good waves when the waves are on unfortunately that's that's noosa possibly <laughs> <laughs> yeah most of the time we're driving five minutes down to the groin and it's flat but um you know, it is what it is. You generally get some waves on the points. It's just not really when the contest is on. Just before the contest, I know I saw you guys out there surfing with Cyclone Omar. Is Omar? Yeah. Yeah. What did you guys think of the waves then? <laughs> yeah, that was pumping. I spent, I think I spent almost a month up there before the contest started just because I saw that swell coming and, you know, the opportunity was there to go up and stay and, and just make the most of the swell. It was, yeah, it was pumping. The sand was crazy. First point wasn't very good, but um, yeah, the rest of the points was probably the best sand I've ever surfed up there. Till maybe like go back to like maybe oh, 2006 or something. We had a pretty crazy year when I broke all my bear boards. Um, the sand was pretty similar then. Mm -hmm. So yeah, I mean, anytime you get the Noosa points cooking like that, crowded or not, it's magic. Just wishing that it had aligned a little better. <laughs> yeah, just, but you know what? That's just the way it is. I mean, 99% of contests are running really, really bad surf. That's, you throw a dart at a calendar and, and you hope for the best. And you know, that's one thing I think Relic really nailed was their sort of format of running the events and kind of having windows and then giving everybody a week notice of, hey, you know, we're going to run it sort of these two days. And you, know, you can really cherry pick it then without having to set up the infrastructure and spend hundreds of thousands of dollars to have a scaffolding sitting on the beach not being used. Like that's a really cool sort of format and way to do things. I don't know why WSL hasn't caught on and why nobody else does it. It makes complete sense. Oh. Um, it's a little IPA? more strain on the surfers, but I mean, if you're guaranteed to get pumping surf for your event, wouldn't you rather kind of book last minute and, and tweak things knowing you're going into perfect Malibu? then kind of book to stay somewhere for two weeks and not know if you're going to get swell. Totally. The I, ISA sense. format, that, that, that's got to be one of the most torturous. I've never oh, been at that level, but it, it's mentally draining to follow it and watch it and, and even uh, tune in. It's, oh, it's what, what day is it? What heat is it? What round is it? Yeah, yeah you don't know. Rapid charge seven yeah. or like <laughs> quarter one. It's like, wait, he yeah. lost yesterday. How's he still going? Yeah. Why is he oh, back? This is, in, what? This Dude, is his third rapid charge heat. It's no wonder this result. No wonder there's results that are like skewed or people are like confused because the guys, must, everyone must be so tired by the end of those events. Oh, imagine the judges. Like you're Fine. judging all day. They've got two areas running all day for what is it, like 10 or 12 days straight? Like, yep. The judges are done at a WSL contest. Like they start to get fatigued at the end of an eight hour day. Like those, those ISA guys are running eight hours a day for 10 days straight. Like, Man, that's, and they've got that's pretty rough. And, juniors and all the same sets of judges. Yeah, you're switching. Like when, when I did the ISAs, it was like bodyboard and stuff was in it. So you'd be switching complete disciplines over and over and over again, back to back heats. It's like, how do you have the same panel of judges judging that? It doesn't, like, I don't care how good of a judge you are. That's really hard to switch. It's hard to switch from men's to women's, yeah. let alone from like bodyboard to sup to longboard to shortboard to women's. Like it's, it's a crazy, yeah. crazy system, but yeah, I mean, you have to, to fit all those surfers in. So, I hope you're taking notes, Sean, contest director over there. Yeah, mate. Um, I'm going to cut my panels down to one judge. Okay. <laughs> Wait. <laughs> well, we won't have to worry about one judge throwing a high score and one throwing a low. It's yeah. Just, it's <laughs> we no arguments there. It, um, no count, it, it is hard as a contest organizer. Um, yeah, trying to fit in with budgets and all that sort of thing, especially with, yeah, the companies just do not normally chuck dollars at longboarding, but yeah, we are working hard on that. Yeah. Um, and I know, yeah, from judging myself, like I can judge three heats pretty good. If I go into a fourth heat or, yeah, have a couple off and come back and judge a couple more, my concentration's gone. Yeah. yeah. Sort of, um, I don't know how, yeah, a lot of the panels, just sit there and they just have one one off and they're back on for two or three and then one off. I just can't do that. No, no, I can't. I've, I sat down and judged like a Grom contest a couple of years ago and I got through like, I think two heats and the third heat. I'm like, well, how do you differentiate between a three and a three? Like what? I just couldn't like mentally, I couldn't do it. I'm like, that's that wave was kind of the same as that wave. Like, 
but it, it's the difference of someone making it through a heat. Yeah. It's like so much pressure, but so little margin to kind of try and decipher and wrap your head around it. How do you, I, I don't know. I really struggled with it. I give a lot of props to all the judges out there, man. That's a hard, hard job. Yeah. As a commentator, I, I sit alongside judges quite a lot and you hear the conversations going on. And I think the scoreline that appears or that comes out of the speakers doesn't necessarily reflect the disparity in the opinions of those judges. Um, the, the smoothing effect of the head judge kind of thing. But um, I see a timer with, with current, you know, technologies and things where everyone will have an app on the beach and everyone who's watching can vote. And that way you're averaging, yeah. averaging out yeah. 200 scores, you know? Yeah, I mean, then it becomes a popularity contest, though. <laughs> that's a that's a different. Yeah, I don't know. It, there's, I do think that you know we've been kind of going off the same judging, like the way we judge for how long now, like judging panels, and it, it, is there a different way to do it? Like, is there? Uh, I don't know. Like, it's you look at the way, like snowboarding and stuff's judged. Like, yeah. So see, so how, well, and, and how before that, that? It was, before that, it was the every comp was in Hawaii and uh, pretty much. Um, and yeah, it was certainly a popularity contest. Yeah. You can have a tracking button. system on your board that will tell you how many degrees of a turn you did and how many Gs you generated and all this sort of thing. But then as soon as you throw in all the stylistic elements, then all of those. Oh, well, that's what I wonder. Like I've, I've had a few conversations with people over the years, like, you know, snowboarding's judged in kind of a cool way where they have a style judge and an amplitude judge and a, you know, they have all these judges kind of, in different categories Definitely. and then it can kind of evolve from there and i had a really good talk ben skinner's actually really tuned into this whole thing but um yeah this like aren't we kind of due for a rewrite of the way that longboarding or surfing in general is judged like there has to be a better way it was done in 1954 the sports come a long way competitions come a long way like i feel like maybe we're kind of due for a little bit of a rewrite of the way that that the judging happens like you five guys with different opinions and you average out a score that's cool but what if you had guys like really zeroed into the classical traditional aspects of longboarding but then you also had a guy on the panel who was really tuned into the performance side so if you weren't meeting the traditional side you might get a two but on the performance you might get a seven and vice versa and then that kind it. of averages itself out i love it is that the so, sort of conversations you guys are having at the top of the uh, the pointy end of the competitive longboarding world do you guys chat about that sort of stuff well, it gets thrown a lot around a lot. Like, we've all got different ideas and different opinions. And, you know, I think there's a ton of respect at the pointy end of things for every different aspect and every different approach and every different style. Like, you know, we all have a deep appreciation for the difficulty and, and how much commitment and time and, you know, the, the, just the amount of skill that it takes to be able to surf like that, regardless of what your approach is and, and to do it well and to do it with flow and, and style and seamlessly. So, yeah, I think at the point in there's a ton more respect than what you might hear through some media outlets or, or whatever you want to listen to. But, um, yeah, I mean, look, it's hard to surf good on a longboard. I don't care what your approach is or, or what type of board you ride it. To make it look good is hard. Yeah. And in challenging waves, it's been given in the last um, 18 months, is 24 months, it's really tricky and um but just think about shortboarding manly at the beginning of the year uh this year was one of the last um i guess events uh before everything shut down because of covid i was watching one of the qs events and my gosh we talk about you know uh, small disparities in longboarding and you know footwork and when it's one foot there's really not much you can do on a you know on a, on a wave but imagine on a shortboard i mean these guys are struggling to get to their feet and they're, they're whacking off two turns and air reverses and they're measuring, I mean, I was like, I asked the judge, I was like, what are you doing? You're measuring spray or like, I, I have no idea how you judge this. These, these guys are surfing identical. And it's so hard on a QS level because everyone can do an air reverse. Everyone can do a snap. Everyone's variety of tricks is so, so vast. And um, when it came down to it, he said, at the moment, it's the guys that are strong and powerful that make it look easy. And um I was like, however they determine that is obviously they're watching replays and things like that. But yeah. um, it's funny. It, it's the same winners or should be the same winners when the waves get really good. Um, but yeah, it's not always the case. So that's where you mentioned about those different uh, facets of judging. I think that's a really good point. Um, you know, specialties and someone who's in charge of that specific, um, you know, part of the criteria. I think that's a good I'm point. Sure. I'm it just, 
as the waves get better, the restrictive nature of the current interpretation of the criteria um, it becomes more obvious. You know, after the second or third section, I mean, I've watched Taylor surf so many times over the years and in knee-high isolators, he finds an 8.5 because he's done a beautiful perched 5, 10 combo in control, steep, fast, then done a nice drop knee roundhouse cutback um, and then back to the nose again and then a big closing manoeuvre for argument's sake. Um, what's, I don't know, I find it really hard to watch and take away that big belt at the end because that's not considered to be uh, functional or cool. I, 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 I'm on the side of the fence, I want to see all of it. I can't do a nice clean nose ride. I don't expect to get a 10, but um, I don't want to be relegated to four or five points simply because I didn't hold my hands the right way on the nose. Yeah. Look, I mean, that's where it comes back to that whole judging thing that I was talking about. I mean, you can, you can surf beautifully on anything and, and sort of in any approach. And like I watch, I'll use Harrison for an example. I watch him and I go, that's a nine five. Like that was a perfectly surfed wave for his approach the way that he wants to surf and, and, you know, like his timing, his flow, everything he did, like, no, there's no huge turn there, but to me it was as good as you're going to get yeah. the way that he likes to surf. And then I'll do the same thing and I'll watch Harley or, or Ben Skinner or Kai or, you know, any of those, any of the performance guys and I'll, I'll have the same response. It's like, man, you can't do it better than that on that equipment with that approach. Like, and then you kind of come back to the judging thing and that's where, I think the judges get kind of strung up because how do you, you're reading a criteria, you're either ticking it or you're not. And it's like what interpretation, like everybody says it's the same criteria, but it's a different interpretation now. It's like, well, everybody who reads that has a different interpretation. So what, what is the interpretation? It's a new focus. You know? yeah. it's, just, it's just really hard to get a straight answer. Like as a competitor, I just want a straight answer of this is the criteria and this is what we're looking for. I still haven't got a straight answer. I think it, that they did deliver a straight answer on the broad spectrum saying this year more so traditional longboarding will be being scored. Um, interpret that the way you want, but I think traditional longboarding, and I don't think it's been mentioned in our little WhatsApp. Uh, well, not little. I'm sure there's probably hundreds of people in, our, in the WSL athlete WhatsApp uh, message. Um, but... Nat Young won in 1966, um, surfing a longboard, how no one else has surfed a longboard ever before. He was actually breaking trim, doing turns. Yep. Um, and on a broader spectrum, and, and actually, you know what? No, it's not. The Californians were really good at nose riding. The Australians were comparatively not. We didn't have the technology with the boards. We didn't have the, the, the skilled shapers to be able to create those boards. And we didn't have the waves for it. No. Um, we had small hollow point breaks that were designed to be surfed fast and zippery. Um, Nat took that approach and, and basically blew people's mind and it's possibly gained more notoriety in the last decade, that 66 performance, than it did at the time because shit moved so quickly from 66 to 69. Boards went from you know 9.4 down to 6.4, down to 5.4 yep. by 1970. Um, and people just tuned in and dropped out and, you know, competitive last year was lost for a few years and I came back with a vengeance with the Hawaiians who then, you know, took it to another level with proper waves. And um, it's, it is hard when we're talking about longboarding. It's such an old sport. Um, or and there's so know, many different definitions of, form. there's so many different definitions of traditional. But yes. are we talking that? Like, are, are we talking that? Because there wasn't a yeah. whole lot of nose riding going on. No, right? Exactly like, right. like there was, and it was beautiful, but it was really pocket surfing, constant, yeah. constant maneuvers, flow. Like that was more what it was about. And then, For sure. uh, is that what we're talking about traditional? Because two years ago, I'm at the world tour events watching those ride contests. Yeah. And then all of a sudden we got flip tailed. Everybody's riding a freaking board that looks like it's got a half pipe on the tail. Like, yeah. uh, I mean, just so you can stall in nose ride and then there's no turn. Yeah. And it was like, hold on, guys. Like, we're going, like, to me, I was at a point where I was like, dude, this is going way the wrong way, guys. Like, I'm, I'm 100% behind. Look, we needed to kind of bring, you know, reward nose riding more and reward classical longboarding more and reward flow and style more. But it went so far 
into just a nose ride contest. It, like it hit the nylon. It literally, literally the, the three highest scores of one of the events, there wasn't a turn done on the wave. Yeah. Like, to me, that you read the criteria, it talks about variety. It talks about flow. You know, it talks about all these different things. And, dude, they were just rewarding, rewarding one word in the criteria, and that was nose riding. That was it. Like, we went so far the wrong way, guys. It was crazy. Yeah. Like, it, I, it, I was even watching, like, you know, Harrison and Justin Teets and stuff, and they weren't getting rewarded two years ago because they were doing too many turns. They weren't just standing on the nose. Yeah. Like, now it's slowly starting to come back, and I think it still needs to go more. But, you know, mm -hmm. I, I mean, yeah. man, watching a nose ride contest, it, like we were in Taiwan and it was a nose ride contest and it was six to eight foot and howling onshore. Like to me, I was just, I was sitting there just watching it going, man, this is so bad for longboarding. Like trying to watch that. It just doesn't, it's not appealing. It doesn't do it. Like you got to ride the right board and surf the wave, the way that the wave wants to be surfed. And that, that is beautiful surfing. And yeah, that's what should be rewarded. And that's Devin's. That's a big thing with what Devin says. It's beautiful surfing, rewarding, beautiful surfing. Like, yeah. sorry. <laughs> beautiful surfing just shouldn't be forced you know what i mean like beautiful surfing shouldn't be forced whether it's one way or the other like yeah it should nah, just match the way and look right you did that was it a quarter you and harry in taiwan yeah i think it was uh yeah yeah it was a quarter, yeah, it was a quarter. that was that was a nice hit to watch um obviously the wind was i don't think it was as much of a factor in that heat as it was in some of the later ones but um that was really cool to watch in the backside because it um yeah i know you probably would have wanted to do a few more turns but um 100%. i agree the, the nose riding was a little bit you know yeah there was some definitely some odd heats and uh i don't think yeah, well, i'm even going back to the year before that like yeah that year was was pretty nose ride heavy but the year before that was like a whole different oh uh, yeah 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 i'm here I, I don't even know what i was watching like i was just like guys like guys were avoiding turns yeah and like dragging their arm in the top of the wave so that they could get back to the nose again it was like guys that's not that's not flow that's not beautiful surfing well i don't know what that is but that you're just forcing nose rides and that's not displaying beautiful surfing yeah, yeah. it drove me not like it was painful for me to sit there and watch and just go man like i'm like thinking back to like Bo and bonga and and Colin and Joel and just going, man, these guys would be here watching this. Tournament going, what is going on? Like, what is this? Like, I don't know if they still watch the contest online or stuff, but they would have just been looking at it going, this isn't the longboarding that we envisioned the generation after us to have. Like those guys were all about riding the right board for the conditions and, and doing it beautifully with style and flow. And, you know, I think that the way that those guys surfed was insane. And, you know, I think we kind of lost that a little bit. Well, I was that little, oh, sorry, Sean, go, yeah from yeah having watched heaps of it we've made it too complicated um yeah by really f focusing on all these little things because your father-in-law many years ago came out with a statement which i still um i use all the time and all he said was it's about using all of the board on all of the wave and i, I still think that is so simple that's exactly how we want to see it um, yeah. We don't want to see somebody just back foot surfing. We don't want a nose. Yeah, we want to see, yeah, everything. Yeah. Oh, 100%. I mean, I, you know, prior to all that, like when I was first kind of coming on the tour in the years following it, like we went way too far performance. Like, I don't have any problem saying that. Like we went, it was pretty much tail surfing contest. You go run up and tap the nose once and then step back on the tail and bash it to the beach 10 times and it was a 10. Like, you know, we went too far that way and then we slowly came back and then we, now we went too far the other way and hopefully yeah. we're going to come back to kind of a middle ground. And, you know, for me, the key to that is having more diverse locations. Like, uh, you know, I don't want to see the tour show up at one foot point breaks all the time. Um, you know, I, I just think the youth really got to learn to ride a variety of waves on a longboard and, and ride different types of longboards so that you can ride those variety of waves. And you know, I think the Hawaiian kids right now are kind of embracing that. Like, man, you live on Oahu and the South Shore goes flat and the North Shore is six foot. What are you going to do? Yeah. You better pick up a, you know, performance longboard and get over there and ride it or some sort of modified thing so that you can surf those waves. I and can't believe it's like, about people upset summer's ending. I'm just like, you're in yeah, a that, To me, what? that just blows my yeah. mind. Like, <laughs> yeah, me too. People are avoiding swell. Like, what are you I doing? I know. Like, like yeah. we sit around and like, 
I don't know. They sit around and stir and wait and watch forecasts and look at weather maps and like froth out for the next yeah. swell. And I feel like, you know, there's a generation or, or a group of individuals now that are like, well, there's a swell coming. We better go around the corner over there where it's not going to hit. Like, sure. cause they just want to surf knee high waves all the time. And it's it? cool. I get it. It's, it's an <laughs> enjoyment, but you know, yeah. like they get their kicks doing something different. But I think if you're, you're trying to be at that professional level and you want to be a well-recognized name, you really got to, have a diversity and be able to ride everything and you know be like a modern day bongo like bongo was kind of the epitome of that and, and Bo and joel and colin like they all there was no fear when it came to 10 foot and there was no no hesitation when it was two foot no, no, they charge, really embraced it charges all of them and um yourself as well not scared of a, of a decent swell we had an episode a couple of weeks ago about our scariest moments in surfing have you had one yourself um yeah i've had a few <laughs> uh, yeah i've had some i'd rather not remember for a long time a couple pretty sketchy back injuries um one in indo on a boat trip that you know really scared me it could have gone really bad and i got very very lucky that it didn't and i came out of it and i made it back to california and yeah got good news that you know i basically could have been paralyzed very easily and by by millimeters i wasn't and Jeez. Yeah, just some sketchy, you know, I laid on the bottom of the boat for two days and, and yeah, it was a scare, super scary, like having your whole body go numb and not being able to, to move your hands or feet for a couple seconds underwater and then feeling it come back. It's just a very scary, a scary sort of experience that, yeah, just can all go so wrong so fast that, yeah, I'm just stoked that, that it's a memory and I got to move on and, and yeah, I can surf again. It's all good. Um, sorry to bring up the competitive thing, but just before we divert from that, I had um, a question to ask you who, two questions, who in your opinion is your most uh, current competitive arch rival uh, that you find tricky to beat or it's on every single time? I think I've got a fair idea, but um, if you don't say him, I'm going to bring him up next. Modern? Like, like as in still on yeah. tour today? In the, last, in the last few years, yeah. Or in the last five years or something. Oh, oh, oh. Um, Harley's always been gnarly, but we don't match up like apart from the malfunction, I think we matched up every single year, but apart from that, like on the world stage, we didn't really have very many heats together, but I always feel like we're pretty evenly matched and we have a very similar approach to a competitive like game strategy and heats and, and how we like to format approaching a heat. So he's always a nightmare for me, but, um, yeah, recently, uh, dude, Harrison's gnarly. Mm. And that's a completely different, like, that's also super gnarly because we have such different approaches. But I, I feel like... Edward Pero. Oh, yeah, dude, Edward's so gnarly. I mean, that only guy, like, <laughs> you've got his number. That guy is so... Good pick up, man. Yeah, but I have his number. I don't know, dude. Edward's so gnarly. Like, he's... Uh, most of the events you show up to, he's the standout from the get-go, from the free surfs. Yeah. He's, I feel he's sorry a, for you though. He brings his absolute A game to you and you bring oh, your absolute A game to him. Well, that's, that's competition, isn't it? That's yeah. why we compete. Like that's yeah. why I compete is because it brings out a different level in my surfing. Like if I just go down to the beach and just surf, I don't surf like I do in a contest because I'm not under the pressure and you know, that competitive nature inside me doesn't come out. I just kind of cruise and you know, yeah, have fun. But um, yeah, that competitive side of like putting your back up against the wall and you got to come out swinging and, you know, I definitely have some gnarly heats with Edward and, and some sick moments and, you know, calls that will go one way or calls that go the other. Like we've had them both go our way and both not go our way. And, you know, it's devastating. But at the same time, like Edward, I, dude, I have so much respect for that guy and his ability and his dedication and his drive and like his hunger for a world title. Like, Dude, uh, guy's one of my favorite surfers, hands down. So, you know, I'm just, I'm stoked to have the opportunity to surf against him in the heat. There's nobody I'd rather have. Like when it comes down to that, I just prefer to have him in a final and not lose out in the quarters. <laughs> so, you know, like I just prefer both of us to be in the final so that we can put it on at the end. And, and you know, with a second, you're still, you're not happy, but you're content. No, that's good. Thanks. I'm glad I... Ask that one because no, uh, no, that was a good. I forgot about it. Across the board, so many different waves too. Like Taiwan surf off, you know Malibu. Um, literally, like everywhere I can think of, you know, you guys have 
it's just been where did he did he he beat you in like a three man heat this year at Noosa? I think. You might not remember that, but I'm sure he does. Did he get you in no, you went in Spain? Uh, no, Connie got me in Spain. Oh yeah. Was that Edward and Justin in Spain? Oh that's right, yeah. Yeah. I I can't remember, honestly. Anyway. I just remember I I think I kinda blocked I blocked Spain out. I think I blocked Musa out. Um, (laughs) <laughs> yeah. when, I, when I don't get like near the result I want it, it kind of disappears from memory selectively disappears from memory or goes into that kind of the fuel for the fire memory bank that when I get angry and need some drive it comes out I don't, I don't know sweet mate well um, yeah has anyone got any other questions we had one from one of our viewers asking uh, Taylor if you've got one favorite board like out of all your quiver have you got like an all-time favourite? What's your uh, what's your favourite board? That's from Paul H. Fleming. Flemmer. Um, TJ Pro Thunderbolt Black at the moment is probably my yeah. That's my go-to right now. I'm just I'm freaking out on it. I don't know. Just riding this new tech and being able to throw my TJ Pro into it. Um, you know, I rode my TJ Pro for well every one of my world titles, and I probably rode it on tour for. 11 years or something like um yeah i didn't hop on it one foot to to six foot whatever we had a contest in i was on it and just to be able to just change the tech is like brought a whole new drive in me on that thing and yeah i'm, I'm frothing on it and i don't know i'm just really happy with everything that i've got in thunderbolt right now it yeah the tech's just on another level for me i i just think it's it's different than what anybody else is doing out there and in my opinion, it's opened up a whole nother realm of torsional fix and stuff that, that most surfboard manufacturers aren't even thinking about. And I, I honestly believe that that's going to change the way that people surf in the future. Epic. Well, yeah, for everyone that's kind of, yeah, more expanding on that, you just posted a pretty, pretty good video on socials lately that kind of explains the difference between the two constructions and how you, you know, feel it in your surfing, riding the two different types. And, it's good explanation actually because no one's really really expanded on how it feels to be surfing under those two different types of construction so yeah it's cool yeah, yeah. it was cool it was a cool opportunity to be able to do that you know i mean the, the bottom line is they both both the red and the black text work in any surf it doesn't really matter but you can feel subtle differences that benefit one condition or the other and um Different parts, yeah. of the board. Taylor. Are different parts of the boards that flex, or just different amounts of flex? Or? Yeah, different amounts of flex, different parts. Like you know, the the red has a, a pretty springy feel, and you know, you can. It just yeah, it's just a different feel. I don't I don't know how to explain much more than that. It just feels different, and they feel insane. So it must have been kind of, must have been something wrong with the TJ Pro. I had to go on because I couldn't nose ride it like you do, mate. <laughs> well, it's not really it's not really made for nose riding that one <laughs> that one's more about stand on the tail and, and you know bash it basically yeah. and yeah just speed speed and power that that design was all about that but you can still nose ride it just doesn't quite it's not a log mate i, I love your what you're saying about the uh, the rubber band having sort of sprung back a little bit too far in reaction to some of the high-tech silliness we had going on for a little while there uh, I agree with you 100%. I, I, I love to see it back in the centre where everything counts and you guys can uh, unleash 100% of your abilities again. Um, I can watch you surf all day long, either in a rashy or, or out. Do you have anything about to drop? Have you got any videos we can look forward to? Um, yeah, I'm always working on new stuff. I, I don't know. I've got a hard drive full of clips that I just kind of filter through. I sit on stuff for way too long. I'm not the guy who like shoots a session and comes back and, and puts it out. Um, you know, I've got a bunch of stuff on a hard drive that I filter through, and when the time's right, I, I drop a clip or two here or there. Um, yeah, I'm working on a bunch of new stuff. I'm working on some new fins to go along with the boards, and yeah, it's just, I'm where's, just having a ton of fun. Where's the best place for our viewers to see your most, most recent stuff? Uh, just go on my Instagram. It's Taylor Jensen TJ at Instagram or whatever that, that tag is. I don't even know, but um, yeah, it's that's pretty much where I'll post anything or a link to anything or go on firewaresurfboards.com they're always you know resharing or reposting or you know sending it out there through their channels so they're a pretty good place to gauge it and they've always got stuff coming from harley and cj and ben and kai and you know they're kind of becoming a, a little voice for longboarding as well through that that thunderbolt channel and yeah it's cool to get to see all their clips getting shared out there too 
Hey, just before we go, Taylor, um, I'll put you on the spot. Who's your favourite longboard in Australia at the moment, up and coming? Up and coming? What's the age group for up and coming? <laughs> Whatever you want it to be, mate. Um, Girls, be guys. Could be girls, could be guys. No, no, I'll, 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 um, yeah, you don't have to mention anyone. You're fully putting me on the spot here, man. This, this, uh-huh. Honestly, I just think Oz has just got a ton of really good longboard kids coming. I had young Tom uh, Payne tuning in, watching this, sending me text messages. Um, Tom's one of my favorite surfers. I think he's like Joel, but I mean, in my opinion, uh, sorry, Joel, but I like Tom surfing better. <laughs> <laughs> love you though. I love you, Joel, but like, I don't know, man. Tom's got a really cool style and he's got a good head on his shoulders. And yeah, I just really like the guy surfing. I know Joel's a huge fan too. He's invited him to the duct tapes and you know, the guy's got a really, really cool approach when it comes to classic longboarding and, we also I yeah. took in some huge waves this year in, in Sydney and up the coast during those swells. We got some double, triple overhead waves and he sent it um, as well. So he's pushing. Good boy. Up. That's it. That's why I wanted to see all these kids. Like there's a ton of really good kids who, you know, they put out clips of, of waist, chest high point breaks and beach breaks and stuff. But like, I want to see those kids start pushing it. Like I saw a clip of Connie in the back door that was pretty nuts last year. So I know he's definitely pushing it gnarly i think the oz kids got to step up mm. get over to wa and and start charging some big slabs and i don't know man ring yeah, up the corvettes I... ring up the corvettes <laughs> and talk those guys into showing you out to the right or something uh, you, know, you, you weren't I'm... talking you weren't talking about the whalebone taylor no yeah. <laughs> okay, if we can move the whalebone down to yelling up then i think we're on to something that's... there well actually gunny gunny's watching and he said it's always been a pleasure to have you over for the whalebone okay. he lives at yelling up on the beach there now come on much. gunny what's the deal there you go. Go. Taylor's no. I've, I've i've been to wa like six six or seven times i've never been outside of perth bro <laughs> dude i've never it's always hey. a funny time of year where i'm going back to california and i just don't have time but Man, I would love to have a contest down there. Like, I watch all those Aussie titles they had there and stuff. Like, like why, why don't we have a longboard contest there? Can we make that happen, Dunny? Please? I'll help. <laughs> Whatever we got to do. Let's do it. Let's do that. So, Taylor, just before we wrap it up, what is your favorite place to surf in Australia while you're here anyway? Um, really? Honestly, Australia has so many rad waves and sick little beach breaks around every corner and the winds northerly you go here the winds southerly you go there like i just think you know growing up in california like the wind blows south that's it you're not surfing like the whole coast is just destroyed there might be one place that you can go but it's an hour and a half away australia's got so many rad headlands that apart from like a straight east wind you can always find somewhere that's protected enough to surf and like for me that's the joy of australian surfing like yeah i love snapper and i love noosa and i love all the perfect point breaks they're crowded but you still get waves but um yeah i don't know i just love being able to to always go surf somewhere fun nice one well i think um i think we're gonna wrap it up so thanks thanks very much mate for coming on i know it's um, no worries stoked drums but um yeah i think i think it was uh that was a good episode and i'm sure there's lots of people that are gonna be enjoying watching this back and yeah thanks for all your yeah insights right on no yeah. worries like to do it so Jeez, much wisdom. I'm sorry for being being rude by not being on camera taylor always good to uh, no worries. always good to hear you speak and uh, some of the things you've brought up tonight will start a lot of conversations so thanks cool much. that's the goal uh, a round of applause for jack great job done jack uh, well done it's your new career here we go we're gonna have a, a gonna, jack vlog going on or you just forgot one jack? you gotta ask sean who's on next week Johnny, who's on next week, mate? Right, we've got Maddie Cook. Okay. Yes, Cookie. The number one Sharky supporter. He's going to be uh, telling us what he's been up to. And um, yeah, we'll be having him a hard time as we have with Matt about how bad the Blues went uh, in the state of origin. Yeah, thanks, <laughs> Jeez. All right, well, thanks. Um, yeah, thanks again, Taylor. It was- um, No worries, thanks, guys. On, and uh, yeah. Sure, we'll see you soon. Hopefully, get you on again one day soon. Yep, for sure. Anytime. Yeah, no, that's good. And thanks, Jack. I know you got to run and uh, you got some work you got to be at in the next 13 minutes. Correct. Oh, and get to work, Jack. You, Come on. You and leave you on. Yeah, the rest <laughs> of us keep talking. You see can you guys. <laughs> <laughs> see you.
All Here right, so the live stream stopped, but we're, we're, I'm just still recording on to the um, extended dance mix. Thanks for that, Taylor. That was great, mate. No worries. Thank you guys for the opportunity, man. I'm so to get on and talk. I, I feel so rich. I, I just put up a post on our Facey page that from um, when Jagger sung Three Little Birds at the Australian. Oh, Oscars. yes. I was, I was going to bring it up, and then I was like, because the camera's not working, I, just, I was trying to talk as little as possible. Hard to tell. But um, <laughs> that was probably my favourite memory from surfing like competitions a lot of my favorite memories are not happening in the water um but that to me that was just absolutely epic i'm standing there and that was insane you know it's three generations was... and just that just awesome yeah yeah that was uh, uh, i've i've actually got to find that i wonder where that clip is i've got it somewhere but um yeah man how cool was that having that there and yeah singing three little birds yeah what a trip <laughs> It's so those we, moments, though, that you really remember. Like, you don't, I mean, you remember the wins, you remember the losses and everything, but it's like the stuff that happens in between and those moments that you get to share with friends and family. And that, to me, is the draw of the contest. Like, looking back on a career, it's like those moments are what you cherish and what you memory. You know, it's just like, it's so sick. I don't know. It's a lot of, a lot of memories, a lot of emotion floods back. Watch, like, my daughter's seven now. Like she was what one two maybe like it's just uh, yeah what a trip like how fast did that go like holy it makes me feel old but <laughs> so right. you, well, at least we don't at least we don't look super old Taylor like um speak for yourself man I'm I don't know dude I gotta keep a hat on all the time now. <laughs> yeah, I'm getting that funny red. spot up there getting all red and sunburned and Jesus. I'm like trying to find a hat to surf in. That's how you know. You're I swear, Joel's guy. looked fifty for twenty years, though. Yeah, he, he wasn't too good on his body, I don't think, for a while there. But um, yeah, I don't know. That gray hair starts coming out. You start looking a little bit older. But miraculously, uh, it, like it goes blonde all of a sudden. Yeah, yeah, mine, mine doesn't go blonde. Mine just gets grayer and grayer. Yeah, right. No, no. I mean, I mean, it starts start leaving growing. the head and growing on shoulders and like. Weird oh, I'm spots. saying like, like Joel's yeah, that's when you're old. When it starts growing in places that never used to grow before. Yeah, you're like, oh wait, what? It's gone from my. But I might head. be it's starting like a rumor here. Jo back. I'm saying Joel's got shoulder length gray hair and then shaves it, then grows back blonde. What? Mm, <laughs> you never know. Yeah. Maybe he's not as stressed as he used to be, and he's starting to kind of come back to. Yeah, he's been playing with colourful boards lately. You never know. He's, he's revisiting his youth. Yes. <laughs> so, so I'm right to use all this bit for the YouTube video, obviously. Of course. Yeah. <laughs> I don't <get> it. <laughs> Has, Hashtag Maddie stabs Joel. <laughs> <laughs> there you go. Stab Magazine will put it up. It'll be great. Yeah. yeah man. Thanks, 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 Taylor. And keep us, no keep, worries. Keep Thank you, guys. Stuff. Yeah. We've got a, the Oz longboarding Insta. So if there's anything you're dropping, please find yep. it. Be great. Cool. Will do. Appreciate it. And uh, yeah, so I still, guys, I still have got no idea why the camera wasn't working. And, and, and anyway, but um, so Cookie next week. Yeah, that's yeah, cool. It'll be good. Be a good um, he, he's been doing a heap of different things, so uh, as well as running around wearing a sharky's jumper, but um, <laughs> running comps, and he's got a new baby and all that sort of stuff. Nice. Oh, becoming parents. Wow. Cool. Yeah. Uh, it's another sign we're all getting old. Yeah. <laughs> Once you get, you just gotta. Oh, uh, <laughs> how old are you, Kara? You're you're young, right? Um. How how old do you think I am? Oh, <laughs> danger! Danger! <laughs> I'm not going there. I don't know many things in life, but that's a dangerous question. Nah, I'm 27. <laughs> oh, see, I would have said early 20s, so I would have been good. Yeah. Sweet. <laughs> yeah. You know, yeah, so see, so you got plenty of time to have kids and stuff. Just wait. <laughs> kids are so gnarly. It's like a whole nother level. We just got like a little puppy dog, and that's basically a baby. <laughs> oh, there you go. That like buys you a good, you know, five years or ten years or something. I don't know. Yeah, exactly. Yeah, kids are just crazy. I love my kids, but they're full on. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> they take up a lot of time. Yeah. How old the baby good. now, Taylor? She's two. Yeah, right. And she couldn't be more different than Jagger. Like, That's what that trips me out, man. It's so gnarly. Like, we have two girls come out of the same two parents. Like, you kind of, we, we thought we were getting another one of Jagger. And <laughs> th this thing came out that is just on a different planet. Like, it, it really, it literally couldn't be more, like, she couldn't be more different than Jagger, personality wise, everything. It's like the exact opposite almost of Jagger in a really cool way. Like, just, 
yeah, it's just a trip. But like you can get something so different out of the same product. Are they compl like complimentary when you kick back and watch the two of them? Can you sort of see that they're like? Oh, 100%. Yeah, one's like super aggressive and naughty and cheeky and but like just like full, full on 24-7. She does not stop. And then Jagger's like super calm and mellow and like really kind and just, yeah, just a different, I don't know. It's just bizarre. It's so bizarre. Kids are so bizarre, like seeing that. And then I guess we kind of see it in ourselves too. Like, I don't know which one takes after which parent. And <laughs> yeah, it, it's cool. It's really cool like, to get to, yeah, I don't when know. One... Little shit, it's always the other parent they take. <laughs> always, <laughs> always. It's like, it's, no, it's not my kid. It's your kid. When it's, uh, I do some beautiful it's... artwork. It's like, look what my child did. <laughs> yeah, totally. Exactly. That, it's like, oh yeah, that's my girl. And then the other time it's like, look at what your kid's doing. Like, it's, you think it's, you've, it's, um... it's, if a fourth world title doesn't come your way, there might be a uh, another one in the family, another I Jensen did. winning one. Oh, I don't know. I don't care. I don't really. I mean, whatever. That's up to them at the moment. Yeah. My daughter really loves singing and art and music. Right. Is is Jagger and Zion's too young to really love anything other than trying to get lollies and ice cream and watching bluey and you know like she she's just a cheeky little thing she's like drawing on me and jumping on me and yeah being super rough with me so who knows i don't know but how's Nava going? Yeah. is she getting away of course yeah well, course. i love that balance you guys always have where you can take it in terms of what with, with that's it you just tag team and you know we're kind of fortunate that nava likes really clean conditions and you know i, I i'm quite happy surfing onshore so it Your works out really well life. like she can go and check it and if it looks good she's out there and you know i'm just super happy to hang out with the kids and and wait for my turn like man she she's pregnant twice like that's so gnarly like i couldn't like not surf for that long and to like have your body go through such crazy transformations of growing a human like you take like whatever that. whenever you want to surf you go please yes. go like you you more than deserve to surf as much as you want whenever you want like whatever and we're just like that as parents it's 50 50 like we tag team nava has her business that she runs and she goes and does her thing and when i've got stuff i gotta do i go run and do mine and we just swap off and it works beautifully did you get a recipe in the book i can't remember yeah i had to beg for it but i got one yeah <laughs> <laughs> i did i did get one but um, what was your recipe yeah. Macadamia nut crusted halibut. Actually, I've since and I've since become a vegan and no longer eat meat. And yeah, it's a trip. <laughs> but, really? Yeah, I've, I've have gone full vegan. Wow, well, when was that? I wish I asked that question. Um, Shit. A little while ago, actually. My, well, you know, my wife's been vegan forever. Yeah, like yeah, she's yeah. and her mother as well. And I just kind of I don't know. I just got over it. Mm. I got tired of it, and you know, I wasn't super healthy there for a while, and. I don't know. I just kind of switched. I just hit a switch and then, yeah, like I stopped. I haven't had a beer since Noosa. Yeah. Like for me, I was always a couple beers at night, kick back, cruise. And you know, after Noosa this year, I was just like, you know what? Like, I just need to change something. Mm -hmm. I'm just kind of like, you know what? I'm going to stop drinking beers and see what happens. And at the same time, I'm like, yeah, you know what? I'm going to keep go further into this whole vegetarian thing and kind of go down the vegan route. And I have a few slip ups here and there with ice cream and stuff. But <laughs> for the most part, I'm just, yeah, I'm vegan. But I don't know. I feel like there's so many products out there now for vegans and vegetarians that it doesn't matter. Mm -hmm. Kind of especially like, where you're at, not exactly where you guys are living, but you know, within your zone, there's some pl cool places to go and you know, you're not isolated to having to just eat at home all the time as well. No, for sure. But with, with the whole COVID thing, like we've just been, well, we, I haven't eaten a meal out since Noosa. Yeah. Like, and that's kind of crazy, but at the same time, like it's allowed us to really expand what we make and what we buy and, like it's just a really cool, I don't know, cool byproduct of a shitty situation is like I've gotten a whole lot healthier in the last eight months than I've ever been in my life. Like I lost a ton of weight. Like I don't know. I'm just more up and more going in the morning. Like I just I feel better and yeah, it's right. just been a cool, cool experience. Uh, I wish I'd got onto that. that ah. question. It's a good I'll, I'll so many people going vegan now and yeah. vegetarian and you know, like I I don't know it's better for the planet on one side but on a whole nother side like i don't feel like i've lost any performance i feel like i just gained energy yeah which is a trip because you would think it's i don't know growing up in like a heavy like when i met nava i didn't eat anything green yeah right i didn't eat vegetables all i ate was red meat like That's breakfast lunch and dinner it's actually pretty common with a lot of californians um totally 
Mm -hmm. It's so cheap. Like you go to the market, you get a big old slab of carne asada and you're good. Like it's just easy, but yeah, I don't know. I've gone full circle now. So (laughs) who would have thought, who would have thought I'd been a non-drinking vegan at 36. I didn't see that one coming. Have you lost a bunch of weight since you stopped drinking? I've lost a lot of weight since Noosa and stuff. Yeah. um, You can see it in your face. It looks similar in your face. Yeah. Your neck. Yeah. Yeah, I'm just I'm just healthier. I don't know. I mean, I don't know. People tell me all the time, "Well, you lost a lot of weight." I don't. I don't really notice. I don't believe in weighing myself. I'm really against it. Um, I just think it just makes you feel shitty, and uh, I don't seen, like to be. Are you hints I don't. Of a six pack? Huh? Are you seeing hints of a six pack? No. <laughs> <laughs> You're rocking the. I've got off. two. I've got two kids who leave like a half a plate of food. Yeah. When they're done eating, like I, yeah. I'm not letting it go to waste. But. You're fully qualified to tell dad jokes and have a dad bod. You're all good. That's it. Then I'm probably gonna put that dad bod to work. That's why I do big turns. It's like I gotta have some weight behind me. I'm gonna go eat a little bit more. <laughs> so yeah, I'm, I'm just. I think that's kind of what happened. Like I went vegan, and then I kind of eat more, and I, I don't know. It's just I, I, weird. I always had a theory, Taylor, that there should be like a height of the, like the length of your board should be your height plus X amount as a minimum. So if someone's five foot six, they could ride an eight six. If someone's nine, you know, six foot six, they have to ride at least a nine six. Do you reckon there's any any validity to that sort of theory about the size of the board to match the surfer? Um, <laughs> yes and no. I think that where the hang up is for me is that a nine foot board fits way better in the wave face when you're talking about surfing close to the pocket than a nine six or a ten foot board. So there's kind of some advantage and disadvantage playing around there. And so what are you riding? Like what, what length are you riding? Right now, well, on my TJ Pro, it's nine, nine foot and three quarters, whatever the base requirement is. Um, and then I've been riding a nine five gem and a nine six special T lately. Uh, just, uh, I've actually been riding my nine five gem as like kind of a in-between performance log. So when you say I don't know, I, I definitely it? find like a little bit more length actually kind of helps me in, in ways with my footwork and, and just a little bit more flow in a, a, in a weird way. Seen, seen, a lot of, seen a lot of the guys on, on, on tour, it looks, well, just as, as a viewer, it looks like they're adding a few inches. That's why I asked. Yeah, just, I mean, you know, and I know I'm like one step and I'm on the nose. Mm-hmm. And you've got, you know, people just like kind of hyping on all oh, two steps or four steps or, or, you know, whatever you consider a step to the nose. And like the judges kind of focusing in on that. And it's like, well, yeah, a nine foot's one step for me. Like I got one comfortable feet, dude, long legs. <laughs> yeah, it's, it's, it's just, it's one comfortable step for yeah. me. Like it is, you know, and you get Just-ing. like a little guy on a 10 foot board and it's like six steps to the nose. Yeah, at least. Just, you just, know, just yeah. no, 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 totally. So it's like, what do you, you know, if that, if that, if that's a thing in the judging and it's kind of has been, um, whether or not the judges say that or not, but in many ways you analyze well, you can analyze the criteria well, and it it does kind of suck for you because it's guys like oh, this is still recording anyway, but uh, not on Facebook, but um, yeah, there's other guys, smaller guys like my height who are um, who try to surf like you, for example, and it makes it look like a fly on a wall. Uh, yeah. Make like the board's not going. They're making the board go in the same axis of the turn as you, but you make it look a lot easier. Um, yeah. And your legs, even though you're a lot bigger, are actually narrower and their legs yeah. are a lot bigger. Um, you know what I mean? And, uh, yeah, yeah, you end up looking squatty because you're shorter. Between to the two step, because it's a, a small guy doing a two step, it's a leap, um, not necessarily a step. Um, where you, it is actually just a, it's yeah, just a standard step. step. Yeah, you and Josh Constable's the same. Um, yeah. And Gabriel Nascimento, um, yeah. Phil, you know, um, Phil looks like he's tripping over himself sometimes. Um, trying, you see, trying to fit in those steps. Yeah. yeah. You see Stephen Sawyer, he looks as though he's running up to the end of the board. and Yeah. That, yeah, so the, I don't know how many steps he takes. I can't count that fast. Some, some of the girls are amazing at it. Like their feet are almost touching as they cross step. Yeah, actually, yeah there's some people know. who can do some crazy amount. Of, like, I, I can't remember who it was, but it was like eight or nine steps to the nose. And I was like, how do you even do that? Like on like a normal size board, I was watching it going, man, I, I can't. My feet are 12 inches. I can't. <laughs> you know, I have to start at the tail. and I just, On a 9.4, I can do 10 or 12. 
Really? Yeah. Routinely. Yeah. Not that I do, I do it as, I do it all as a joke. Like, but my yeah. feet are like, oh, size eight US, but, um, oh, so there you go. That's, yeah. you, you got more room. Yeah. yeah. I don't have the room. <laughs> but I'm five, seven, five, six and a yeah. half or something. So, yeah. Yeah. It makes sense. But I don't know. It, it, it seems like no matter where you go with longboarding and judging and stuff, there's advantages and disadvantages. Like whether yeah. you want to do equipment or w- like whatever it is, there's, there's give and take on every side. So it's a funny one. That's kind of why I'm a, a pretty big believer in changing the way that the whole thing is judged. But I've actually never heard that snowboarding idea before, but I think it sounds really, really good. Think. Yeah, it's a cool. I, I mean, I don't know. Like, what, what did you say, Matt? 1954? Uh, 64. That was the 64. the Aussie um, the Aussie uh, Manly event, the first official uh, world titles. So that's what ISA sort of count as the uh, yeah. you know that first one, and it was the first one that was neutrally judged. The ones before that were all Makaha, uh, which yeah. Midget won in 63 yeah. anyway. Who won um, it, Maddie? Midget. <laughs> <laughs> Just testing your knowledge. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Um, yeah. No, Midget won. Um, so, yeah, honestly, that, that, honestly, the snowy McAllister rule would get put out, brought out where headstands count again. Headstands can be left with surf like clubbies. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> all right. So, um, what do you reckon, guys? To, I'll stop. Yep. Yeah, all good. All, all right. good. Well, thanks very much again. All right. Thank, Thank you, guys. Yeah. That was great. Thank you, <laughs> Talk. Long boy.